Welcome to another episode of Talking Backstage. I'm your host, Tom Lund. Today's guest is someone I've known since elementary school, Michael Winter. Before the stay-at-home orders in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Michael was performing with the Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops as their third horn. A horn player is part of the brass section in an orchestra and plays what we commonly refer to as the French horn. In this episode, Michael shares with us some stories of his time as a student at Placerita Junior High School, as well as some of the pieces and performance opportunities he has had with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. So, Michael, hello. Thanks for taking time out to speak with us. It's my pleasure. It's nice to see you. All right, so first question, nice and easy, is uh, what schools did you attend when you lived in Santa Clarita? When I lived in Santa Clarita, I went to Santa Clarita Elementary School. And then for junior high school, uh, we went to, my brother and I went to Placerita and then Hart High School. Do you remember like what age you first started getting into music? I started playing the piano before I started playing the horn because my mom said it was the best way to learn notes and rhythms and all that. And she was right, but I was a horrible <laughs> piano player. Um, so I think I, I picked up the horn a little more seriously, like as far as starting it because it meant I could quit the piano and that was probably fifth grade or so. Okay. And were there music classes that you were taking through the school itself or was it through outside private lessons? Well, I was taking outside private lessons kind of from the very get-go, um, which most okay. inter most uh, instrumental musicians, that's kind of the main stuff for players who end up going on to play professionally. A little bit of school stuff, but the really intense kind of school playing started when we went to Placerita Junior High because they had a really serious band program um, and as good as the, the arts programs were in the Santa Clarita Valley in general, Las Ritas was kind of a cut above the rest. But the band director at the time was a woman named Catherine Spula, who just retired a couple okay. of years ago, I think. And she was just kind of remarkable what she was able to do with that program. So we decided we would kind of give it a shot and transfer kind of to a different place that was, you know, more difficult to get to and all that, just because we wanted to see what that was like and mm -hmm. and see if that really kind of kept our interest um then we figured okay after two years if the music thing ends up being really important then we go across the street to Hart, who also had a, a slightly you know above everybody else uh level in their band program and if not then we you know easy enough to go to saugus which was also pretty close to our house with you know everybody sure. else we went to elementary school with Right. Now, what was those programs like at the junior high and high school level? Like what made them different? Was it focused more on like classical stuff? Were you learning pop stuff? Like just walk me through that. It was honestly kind of your normal band program. It was the classical-ish band music. Mm -hmm. The difference is I think uh, literally just the quality of the conductors. Um, Anthony Bailey, who I think okay. is still at heart, who came in our second year at Hart High School, was really good. Um, both he and Miss Bula were uh, very disciplined with the whole with the whole class, so I think that made a really big difference as far as dictating how things went. That kind of early attention to detail, even though it's junior high school band, kind of pushing the envelope and and insisting on that discipline, I think really helped move things uh, in the direction that those programs went. And then, what inspired you then? You know, after high school, what inspired you to continue to pursue a career in music? Uh, I really enjoyed playing the horn in general, and I was getting pretty good at it. Um, and I figured as far as performance stuff, it's kind of one of those things, if you think you want to give it a shot, then there's kind of only one time in your life to do it, which is kind of when you get out of high school, you have to swing for the fences and see what happens. And sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. Classical music performance by and large, it's not one of those things that you can decide when you're 35, you know what, I'd like a career change and I want to <laughs> sure. you know, try going this direction. It's a pretty narrow window. Um, so that's kind mm -hmm. of if you want to do it when you graduate from high school, that's it. That's your window. So then were there any teachers that had a lasting influence on your music career? With instrumental musicians, the private one-on-one -on -one teachers is mm, really right. the, the kind of influential people. My grandfather was my first teacher. And he was a really, oh, okay. really well-known uh, horn professor. He taught at Fresno State. Um, across the entire world, people knew who he was because he was really a remarkably fine teacher. Um, and then my other two teachers I had um, when I was still living in the L.A. area, John Mason and Jim Thatcher, 
Um, and then when I got to NEC, my two teachers, uh, both BSO players, one of them, Dick Mackey, who has since retired from fourth horn, and Gus Sebring, who's the associate principal horn in the BSO and principal horn in the Pops. Uh, I started studying with him then, and he's still a member of our section now. What have been some of your favorite pieces that you've worked on or conductors or composers that you've been able to work with? Um, obviously, playing for, playing for John Williams is a tremendous thrill. He used to be the conductor of the Boston Pops, and we see him a couple of times a year. Um, he comes and does and conducts concerts of his own music. So that's always kind of a thrill. All right. So speaking of that, walk me through what's a typical day like? Like if you've got, say, your busiest time of the year or if you've got a concert on the weekend, what does that look like? What are you guys doing to prepare for that? The BSO Incorporated. So we kind of have two brands, Boston Symphony and Boston Pops. They're both under the broad umbrella of the BSO. Um, total in a 12-month period of time throughout the organization. We do roughly 200 concerts and 900 different pieces of music in a season. In a season? In a season. Holy cow. So we, during the, <laughs> during the BSO season, which is roughly September to, um, to December, uh, we okay. have four rehearsals and four concerts a week. During the month of December is Holiday wow. Pops. We do roughly 45 Pops concerts. Uh -huh. So like Monday, Tuesday, Thursday nights, and then double Wednesday, three shows on Saturday, three shows on Sunday. We've managed to get in quite a lot of services. Um, so that's, I mean, we get to do a lot of really, really, really cool stuff. My general routine is I get up at 6.30 so I can shower and warm up before the rest of the house wakes up. We have a two and okay. a half year old daughter. Um, so yes, I got congratulations. Gotta, thank you. Um, so I got to, I have to kind of get that morning chunk in. Um, and okay. by warm up, it's as much just, it's not actually warming up the muscles. Usually we're playing enough. That doesn't take more than a couple of notes. Um, okay. But it's kind of triage, like how beat up am I from the day before? It's a lot of just kind of going, it's like a basketball player shooting free throws. You're not, Sure. You're just kind of working on your fundamentals and making sure your kind of your action is is in a good place. And then as far as other playing during the day, it really depends on what the job has coming up mm -hmm. that week. Sometimes there's playing that's so intense at work. Other than warming up in the morning and playing a couple of notes before rehearsal and concert, I don't do a ton of playing because the, the job is just taking everything out of me. And then the other weeks sure. where it's like, okay, this is a lighter week and I have this other thing coming up. So I got to, I got to really practice and, and focus on that. Gotcha. So when it comes down to like your time management, learning the different um, pieces of music or even learning how to deal with rejection from auditions and stuff, is that something that you think you learned from going to college for music? Do you think it was something that was already instilled upon you? Where do you think you developed those skills? I think going to college for it, going to a music conservatory, which is a hyper-focused environment for that kind of thing, mm -hmm. is really important for a lot of people. And certainly it was for me. Um, it's as much kind of time management because you have a ton of music coming at you. You have to learn pretty right. quickly, okay, what do I need to really sit down and practice slowly and learn? And what can I look at and say, okay, I've never played that, but that'll be fine. I can just play it down and that'll be all right learning that balance and it's different for every person and the mental thing is really really challenging because really the only way to figure it out is to do it and get kicked in the teeth a couple of times and <laughs> you know figure out because everybody's yeah. process for that kind of stuff and how to be able to walk out the door the next day still motivated and like okay cool we're going to keep going and also i mean the pressure of of playing the job is not insignificant either our second concert of Tanglewood last summer, so our summer venue, I was playing principal mm -hmm. or associate principal horn all last summer. So I was playing principal horn of the pops. And our second concert of the summer was all John Williams music with John conducting. And I was out on the lawn with my aunt and uncle because we have like a, it's a 20,000 seat lawn at Tanglewood. Oh, wow. Um, people bring picnics and it's really fun. Sure. Um, anyway, so I was hanging out with them before I went back to play the concert in my, in my, Apple Watch tapped me on the wrist and said, the thing, you know, you know, breathe, it can help re reduce stress. And I looked at it, my uncle looked at my watch and said, not today, I can't. 
<laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> playing a concert where you've got a major solo, sometimes where you're, you're literally everybody stops and it's just you for 20,000 people, they'll kick your heart rate up a notch or two. And the only way to really figure out how to process that and not get in your own head is to do it. So trial by fire. All right. So let's travel back in time. Uh, if there's something that you could like a piece of advice that you could give to your younger self or to the next generation now about what it takes to become a professional musician or any important things that you've learned during your career, what would that be? I think the advice that I would give, which is what I give to my students now at NEC, which are undergrad and graduate students, work your butt off. And when you do, have an attention to detail. It's not just about, well, I spent three hours playing the horn today, so that's good enough. You have to really want it. You have to really work hard. Across the arts in general, theater, movies, music, um, athletics is the same, really. You've got an incredible flood of talent in an mm -hmm. incredibly narrow lane for them all to try and squeeze into to, to do something professionally that's lucrative. So you have to work harder than you ever knew as possible. And that attention to detail to refining your craft is incredibly important. That's really kind of what it comes down to. When you look at super talented people, be it Tom Brady or Renee Fleming or you know people like that who are at the apex of their profession, there's a lot of talent, but there's also I mean, like you asked people about Tom Brady and they say, yeah, uh, when he was quarterback of the Patriots, he worked harder than everybody else. He was the first person right. in the stadium. He was the last one to leave. Yep. If you had an answer, he had the question because he had read everything there was to read about this play in the history of that team. It's kind of the same thing, kind of the same thing in our world. Yeah, no, that's, it's really impressive that you guys have been able to do that. Uh, anything else you'd like to talk about or plug while we got you here? No, I'm, you know, this is such a weird time um, yeah. that all the orchestras, theaters, arts districts, uh, movie sets in the entire world have been silenced. And no time yeah. in history that I can think of have we even approached something like this. Um, mm -hmm. It's a really challenging time. It's going to continue to be a challenging time for a while. But the thing I kind of hang on to is the more we're all cooped up indoors, the more we all desperately want a connection the more we want to be able to get back and and have something that we can listen to and watch and participate in that kind of involves us emotionally more than just sitting and watching something on on tv which we're as, as far as any of us can do right now so as dark as this is um i think we will come out of this and we will have the same draw and the same passion as audiences and participants that we've always had because kind of emotionally in our souls, we, we have to have this in our lives. Wow. I, that was beautiful. Uh, <laughs> that was really well said, man. I, I really appreciate you sharing that with us. Thank you very much for taking the time out. It was great yeah. talking with you and, yeah, and you hearing too. again, like I said, this is a world completely unknown to me. I love music. I love listening to orchestral music. No idea how you guys get into it and all that kind of stuff. So it was a great learning experience yeah, for me. Yeah, it's a, it's a funny little world that I live in. Thank you. It's great to see you. It's been a long time. Yeah, man. It's great seeing you too. It was great catching up. So uh, that basically wraps it up. Uh, I appreciate your cool. time, uh, especially since I know you're... You're still East Coast time, so I know uh, it's in the afternoon right now for you, yeah. like late afternoon. So I appreciate you taking time, and uh, I look forward to seeing more stuff from the BSO and from you specifically, my friend. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to Talking Backstage. To watch other episodes, make sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm your host, Tom Lund. I'll see you backstage.